I thought this was funny. Uh, a new year is upon us. At least I hope we are done with 2020. Is it over yet? Is 2020 over? I, I hope it is. I hope it is. I, I guess I'm the only person who thought this was funny. Okay. Uh, a new year is upon us, and what will it bring? You know, a year ago, it was January 3rd, 2020, and we had no idea, did we? We had no idea what would come upon us in 2020. We had no idea what the year held for us. And the truth is, we don't really know what 2021 holds for us either. What will happen this year? We don't know. We just don't know. Will Jesus Christ come for us this year? That's a possibility. Will the tribulation described in the book of Revelation commence this year? That's possible. It could happen, but we just don't know. We don't know. We don't know when these future events will happen, although we do know that they will. God has promised them, and so we believe his promise. Today we come to Revelation chapter 8, and what we find here, as I already mentioned, is plagues in answer to prayer. These are promised future events. This is the stuff of prophecy. We are studying Revelation after all. <laughs> this is a prophecy. This is a promise of what is to come. The cataclysmic judgments will strike the world and those who occupy it at that time. And these events may be closer than we think. These destructive events will actually come in response to the prayers of God's people. And I think it would be helpful for us to just start by defining terms. When I throw out that word plague, what do I mean by that? What's a plague? Well, you could use the word plague as a verb. And in the Bible, as a verb, it literally means to strike, to beat, to blow, right? That means, it means uh, a violent action such as that. As a noun, the word plague often means a destructive blow. So it can be a verb, it can be a noun in God's word. What John describes here in this chapter, in Revelation chapter 8, could accurately be called plagues. They're not explicitly called plagues, not in chapter 8, but I believe that you could accurately describe them that way. These future events are violent, as you already heard, as you already saw, they're violent and they're deadly. And they're judgments of God in response to the prayers of his people. And before we look at this chapter, Revelation chapter 8, I think it would be helpful to do a couple of other things just to get us ready. And the first thing that I think we should do is notice that there is a precedence of plagues in answer to prayer. There is a precedence. This is not the first time that such a thing is talked about in the scriptures. You turn back in your Bible to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 2, and you find these words at the end of Exodus chapter 2. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, that's the Pharaoh, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out for help. What is that? That's prayer. They cried out for help to God. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. Notice it came up to God, almost like smoke ascending upwards. It came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. And so you have these enslaved and these suffering people in the land of Egypt, and what are they doing? They're crying out to God. They're crying out to God. They are praying. And that praying led to the plagues, which are recorded for us later in the book of Exodus. If you were to turn to Exodus chapter 6, you'd find these words from the Lord. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say, therefore... I've heard their prayers, and I've remembered my covenant. Say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. And that's exactly what the Lord did. That is literally what the Lord did. 
Psalm 78 is a nice summary of the plagues in Egypt. Psalm 78. He performed his signs in Egypt and his marvels in the fields of Zoan. He turned their rivers to blood so that they could not drink of their streams. He sent among them swarms of flies which devoured them and frogs which destroyed them. He gave their crops to the, to the destroying locusts and the fruit of their labor to the locusts. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamores with frost. He gave over their cattle to the hail and their flocks to, the, to thunderbolts. He let loose on them his burning anger, wrath, indignation, and distress, a company of destroying angels. He made a path for his anger. He did not spare them from death. He gave their lives over to the plague. He struck down every firstborn in Egypt. This is, this is the stuff of history. This actually happened. Animals, people died. There was great destruction in Egypt. And it was in response to the prayers of God's people. But you might say, wait a minute. I thought that this was God's plan all along. I thought that God had promised this to Abram, later known as Abraham. Way, way, way back in Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 through 14. And you would be right. You'd be absolutely right. These plagues were God's plan long before any of the Hebrews started to serve as slaves in Egypt. Yes, God had promised that this would happen, that he would bring these judgments on those who enslaved Abram's descendants centuries before any suffering started, centuries before any prayers were offered. God's, God revealed to Abram, this is what's going to happen to your descendants. It was promised centuries ahead of time. It was God's plan, but at the same time, and without contradiction, these plagues were truly in response to the prayers of God's people. Now you might ask, if God is sovereign, if God's in control of everything, and if God has a plan and he's going to carry out that plan, then why pray? God's in control and God's got a plan. He's going to carry it out. Why should I pray? Here's the answer to that question. Because your prayers are part of his plan. Your prayers are a part of his plan. Was God going to allow, was God going to allow the descendants of Abraham to dwell in a foreign land and then be enslaved in that foreign land? Yes. Was God planning all along to rescue them? Yes. But the prayers of God's people in that foreign land as they suffered as slaves was a part of his plan. And so are your prayers. Your prayers are part of his plan. So don't stop praying. Because your prayers are a part of a sovereign God's plan. The other thing that I think we ought to do before we actually study Revelation 8 is this. I think that we ought to look at a parable of plagues in answer to prayer in Luke 18. A parable of plagues in answer to prayer. I find it fascinating and helpful to notice that this parable spoken by the Lord Jesus comes to us in the context of Jesus talking about his return to the earth and the judgment related to that. If you were to look at the end of Luke 17 and if you notice verse 8 of Luke 18, Jesus is talking about his return and the judgment surround or involved with that. So let's listen to what Jesus says here in Luke 18. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me what? Justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? 
Will he delay long over them? These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And so we looked at this precedent. We looked at this parable. And now we actually will look at the chapter in front of us, which is a prophecy of plagues in answer to prayer. It's a prophecy of plagues in answer to prayer. Let me just really quick rewind. Go back all the way to where this gets its start in chapter 5. Really quickly. In chapter 5, John says in verses 1 through 5, thank you for joining me there. I love to hear the rustling of the Bible pages. John says here in Revelation 5, that's encouraging, thank you. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And so there's only one, there's only one who can slit those seven seals. And that is this lion lamb. That is Jesus. And he begins to slit those seals beginning in chapter six, verse one. Now I watched when the lamb opened one of the seven seals. Verse three, when he opened the second seal. Verse five, when he opened the third seal. Verse seven, when he opened the fourth seal. Verse nine, when he opened the fifth seal. Verse 12, when he opened the sixth seal. So Jesus in chapter six opens six of the seven seals. But then there's a parenthesis. There's this break. In chapter 7, but now we get to the seventh seal in chapter 8, verse 1. Now comes the seventh of the seven seals. We read this in chapter 8 and verse 1. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Such a contrast, isn't it? I mean, like I've said before, it seems to me. What do you think? That heaven normally is a very noisy place. It's filled with sound. There's, there's loud worship. Thunder-like sounds, crashing and voices and all these things. But now, strangely, uh, uncommonly, there's silence. Silence for about half an hour. John does not hear the thunderous voice of one of the four living creatures or the loud voice of those Christian martyrs. Remember those executed Christians who are in heaven, who are crying out with a loud voice? He doesn't hear that. Not a living creature, not Christian martyrs. No, he doesn't hear that. He doesn't also hear these unrepentant, unbelieving people on earth who are crying out to the mountains and to the rocks to fall on them. Instead, what does he hear? Silence. Here's the sound of silence. In contrast to the loud worship and other glorious sounds which seem to be usually heard in heaven, John records that there is a hush in heaven. The apocalyptic lamb slits the seventh of the seven seals and there is silence. Unfortunately, I cannot tell you exactly what that silence means. It's just not spelled out. I could give you different options, but... I'm not sure how valuable that would be. All I can tell you is that there's silence for about half an hour. What does that signify? It's not spelled out. I'm not going to speculate. Now, verses 2 through 5. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God. If, you're, if, you're, if you've been traveling this path with us, going through the book of Revelation, you'll notice that these seven angels have not been mentioned before. 
There are these seven angels who stand before God, who stand in his presence, and we haven't seen these angels before, not in this book. But he mentions them, and it seems like he mentions them in a way that he assumes or expects the readers to know what he's talking about. I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. It may be accurate to translate that word censer as fire pan. It's, it's a utensil that you carry hot coals on. You carry hot coals on this, and then, and then as you have the hot burning coals in, in the censer or in the fire pan, when you add the incense to it, what happens? Smoke! You take, you take the incense and you put it, you, 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 you add it to the hot coals and smoke rises. So this, it says that this other angel there in verse 3, he came and he stood at the altar with a golden censer or a fire pan. This is a utensil carry, for carrying hot coals. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar. This is the altar of incense before the throne. So, so the, the, the incense and the prayers are being offered before the throne of God. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints, what, what happens? It, it, they, they rise before God. They rise before God from the hand of the angel. Verse 5, then the angel took the censer or fire pan, whatever the best translation is. Look, watch what he does here. He fills it with the fire from the altar. And then what does he do with it? He threw it on the earth. Someone has described this as a gesture of judgment. He, he fills his fire pan with fire from the altar, and with this gesture of judgment, he throws it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. This golden altar mentioned there in verse 3 is the altar of incense, as I said. Both the tabernacle and the temple had such an altar. If you turn in your Bible to Exodus 37, you'd read these words. He made the altar of incense of acacia wood. Its length was a cubit and its breadth was a cubit. It was square and two cubits was its height. Its horns were one piece with it. He overlaid it with pure gold. Not bronze, gold. Its top and around its sides and its horns. And he made a molding of gold around it and made two rings of gold on it under its molding on two opposite sides of it as holders for the poles with which to carry it. And he made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. The whole thing's covered in gold. The whole, the whole, the whole thing is covered in gold. This is the altar of incense which stood in the tabernacle, which stood in the temple. And now, in the presence of God in heaven, we have this golden altar of incense. You know, I think it's fascinating. Do you remember the true account in the book of Luke about John the Baptizer's daddy? Remember John the Baptizer's daddy? He was named Zechariah. Zechariah, depending on how your Bible transliterates it. Zechariah. It was his turn to do what? To offer incense in the temple. Remember that? Remember that? It's fascinating. It's fascinating what we read there in, in Luke. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, it was his turn. According to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people, what are they doing? Well, he's inside at the golden altar of incense, offering the incense. What are the people outside doing? They're praying. Interesting. They're outside praying at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And so all I'm trying to establish for you is that there is, at least at times, a connection between the offering of incense and the offering of God's prayers. Zechariah is offering the incense inside the temple in Jerusalem while the people outside are offering up their prayers. Here in Revelation 8, you have the offering of incense right alongside of the offering of God's prayers. This golden altar of incense is mentioned. That's all I'm trying to establish. In verses 2 through 5 and following, verses 2 through 5 and following, there are these plagues pictured. 
And I, I believe that it, it would seem to me very clearly that these plagues that are mentioned are in response to the prayers of all the saints. And I just want to say, again, because there's a lot of confusion on this, that that word saints is used in both the Old Testament and the New Testament to refer to all of God's people. Saints. This is not an elite group. These are not like the special forces among God's people. These are not like the, the special subgroup of God's people whose prayers really get things done. No. Consistently, Old Testament, New Testament, if you truly belong to God, you are considered by God a saint. You are considered as one who is set apart, one who is consecrated to God. You are a saint. And this talks about the prayers of all the saints being offered up to God and rising up before God. But which, which, which prayers? What are we talking about here? I, I, think that it could, I think it could include at least these prayers. Matthew 6, 9 through 10. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your name be reverenced. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Before the kingdom will come on the earth, judgment must fall. These plagues must strike before the kingdom is established, according to God's word. I think also it would include the prayers of those Christian martyrs, those executed Christians same reference numbers 6, 9 through 10. O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So these plagues which are described are in response to the prayers of God's people who are called saints. Now we read this in verses 6 through 12. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. First angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood and these were thrown upon the earth and a third of the earth was burned. This is incredible destruction. Incredible devastation. Hard to imagine what's described here in our minds. And a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire. John's trying to describe what he sees here. Something like a great mountain burning with fire. What is that? He's, 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 not, he's just trying to describe it for us. It was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from heaven blazing like a torch and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water the name of the star is wormwood a third of the waters became wormwood and many people died and i deserve to be one of them i deserve to die i deserve to be destroyed I am a sinner. I deserve to be included in that number. But by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, this is not my fate. But that is what I deserve. Many people died. In chapter 9, we're going to read about, if God lets us, that a third of humanity is killed. It says it twice in chapter 9. A third of humanity is killed. Millions, millions of human beings die. And I deserve to be one of them. Absolutely, I do. I deserve to die. I deserve God's judgment. I do. I am a sinner. They die specifically here in chapter 8, verse 11, from the water because it's been made bitter. You gotta have, you gotta have drinkable water to live. 
Fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. You remember the true account of those seven priests who were given the seven trumpets in Joshua 6? Remember, they were to blow their trumpets, and then the walls of Jericho will come crashing down, and, and remember all of that? Something similar is happening here. These seven angels are given seven trumpets. And destruction comes. Plagues strike. And these are, these are terrible, awful, but just judgments. And notice God continues to exercise restraint. There are limits to the fiery destruction and death which these plagues bring. But they do go far beyond the quite localized judgments which came upon the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and upon Egypt. Revelation 8, Sister Tell, is, is, is a terrifying scene of devastation and death. But as I already mentioned, even more terrifying judgment is looming. Now, verse 13, verse 13. Then I looked and I heard an eagle, your, your Bible might read angel. Some manuscripts say eagle, some manuscripts say angel, whichever is the original. I don't think it impacts our interpretation of the text. Then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. And it's hard, it's hard to feel the impact of this. It really is. Because when you say, whoa, what do you think of? Or when you hear someone say, whoa, you think about maybe a cowboy riding a horse and saying, whoa, right? Or you maybe think of some, like a surfer dude saying, whoa, you know? You know, like, whoa! That's, when, we, when we use the word whoa, we actually, well, it's actually spelled differently, but... But when you hear whoa, you don't think, whoa, this is, <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. You don't, think, you don't think of something, this is really, really serious. This is, this is a lament. This is an expression of grief. When you hear whoa, you think about slow down, stop, or wow, that's amazing. That's not what this whoa means. This is, this is, this is a, an expression of lament. Uh, this, is a, this is a word concerning upcoming calamity. And, and you find that word woe in the Old Testament and the New Testament. You, fall, you hear that word falling from the lips of Jesus. But this is the only place that I know of in the Bible where it's used three times in a row. This is a unique expression, only found right here at the end of Revelation 8. Woe. 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 It's hard for me to try to explain, the, to, to communicate to you the, the gravity of this, the depth of this. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. Remember that those who dwell on the earth is like a technical term used in the book of Revelation, beginning back in chapter 3, verse 10, repeated in chapter 6, verse 10. Woe to them at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. We've only covered four of the seven trumpets here in this chapter. The other three of the seven are coming. And the woe, woe, woe is connected to those three trumpets. So, so it's, an, it's a rare and extreme emotional expression. And it prepares us for what's found in chapter 9 and following. Because greater calamity is coming on sinners who refuse to repent, on sinners who hold on to their idolatry and cling to their sin, on sinners who continue to reject Christ. Greater calamity is coming. As I already mentioned twice, it says in chapter 9 that a third of humanity is killed. That's a lot of people. That's a tremendous amount of death. Well, so what? 
How do we properly respond to this revelation? Our response to God's wrath should not be simple. <laughs> it's complex. A well-informed response to the revelation in chapter 8 is complex. Our emotions are mixed, and our actions are varied. When we read such things in God's Word, there's a variety of emotions and actions which, which come in response to the plagues and answer to prayer. And I think that the first word that should describe our response to this revelation is glory. Glory. Why do I say that? Because all of God's attributes and actions are praiseworthy. Everything about who God is and everything about what God does is praiseworthy. It's never shameful. It's never dishonorable. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. We should never hang our heads, get uncomfortable when talking about who God is or what God has done or what God will do. This is right. This is just. This is glorious. And so we can praise God that he is a God of justice. God's just judgment and righteous vengeance is a good and glorious thing. It is right for God to uphold his glory and to carry out justice. Do you really want a God who, who, who does not carry out justice? Is that who you really want to be your God? That's not who God is, no matter what you want. The second word that should describe our response to this revelation, I believe, is gratitude. Gratitude. I was uh, chit-chatting with my friend. It's, you know, I don't know if any of you ever used this app called Voxer. It's like a walkie-talkie. Some of you have no idea what a walkie-talkie is, but it's like a walkie-talkie on your phone. It's an app. And I got my friend James Peterson up on the North Shore. He lives up in Duluth, Minnesota. I love to say up in the North Shore. And, uh, and uh, James, James uh, he was working on a project in his house, and I was doing a tiny little project in our house, and we're just chit-chatting about things. And he said... All I deserve is hell. Why, am I, why would I complain? Why would I, why would I get upset? All I deserve is hell. And he's absolutely right. All I deserve from God is hell. And so the reality, the truth, that I'm not going to experience God's judgment, God's wrath, should lead me to be grateful. We should be filled with gratitude. Although we deserve the same from God, we who trust in Jesus have received something else. We have been given mercy. We have been pardoned. We've been forgiven and counted as righteous by God. And so we will not know his wrath. Do you trust in Jesus? Do you trust in Jesus? You are a sinner, my friend. You deserve God's wrath, just like me. You deserve to die. You deserve damnation, my friend, because you're a sinner like me. You have broken God's law. You've offended the God of the universe. You've gone your own way. You've done your own thing. You are guilty before God, and you desperately need his forgiveness. And he offers it to you because he loves you, because Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of your sins. And he rose again. And so, my friend, young or old, male or female, been in church forever, or this is one of your first times, please, please, Trust in Jesus Christ now so that you will avoid his wrath in the future. Please trust in Jesus. Please. And if you do trust in Jesus, be grateful. <laughs> be thankful. Because you know what you deserve, and it's hell, it's death, and it's damnation. Oh, I hope that every Christian in this room would be willing to stand up and say, I deserve to die. And I deserve damnation. That's what I deserve from God. If God's going to be just with me, he's going to be fair with me, he's going to give me what I deserve, all he's going to give me is death and damnation. I don't want God's justice. I don't want what I got coming to me. I want mercy. 
I want God's grace. I hope every single one of you who's a Christian would unashamedly, boldly proclaim to anybody, I deserve to die and I deserve to be damned. That's what I deserve. And my hope is in Jesus Christ alone. I hope every single one of you would, would from your heart, sincerely say, yes, it's true. It's true. That's what I deserve. Death and damnation because of my sin against God. But I have Jesus. And so I am forgiven. And I will not taste his wrath, for Christ has tasted it for me. He has suffered it in my place, and he is risen. Would you affirm that statement? Would you? Would you wholeheartedly affirm that statement? Would you agree with God? With humility and painful honesty. Is that the truth? Do you believe that? We can and we should worship God for his justice and praise him for all his works, including his destructive judgments. But we do so remembering we are sinners who deserve to suffer his wrath. Death and damnation should be my destiny. But God in sovereign grace has delivered me from such a thing. So glory, we praise him. Gratitude, we thank him. Thirdly, grief. I think a, a well-informed response to such a prophecy as found in Revelation 8 is grief. It's right for those who love sin, hate God, and reject Christ to receive wrath. It is right. It is just for Jesus to judge them. And at the same time, we're filled with sorrow. We lament their destruction. Do you remember what it says about Jesus looking out across the city of Jerusalem, thinking about the destruction that would come upon the city of Jerusalem? What did he do? He wept. He was filled with grief. His heart had compassion. These people had rejected him. They had no good reason to reject him. They deserve to be destroyed. And yet, he weeps, he weeps for them. Jesus did not joke around about the severe judgment which the people of Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Capernaum will one day suffer. What did he say to the citizens of such city? Woe to you! A word of lament! Please hear this. Please, please hear this. We cannot talk about the judgment of God like we talk about the, the weather or sports. We cannot, we cannot talk in the same tones, with the same candor, about what we just read here in Revelation 8, like we talk about sports or the weather. We just can't do that. We cannot chit chat about what is described in the book of, Rev in the book of Revelation as if, we were, as if we were rehearsing the stats of a football game. The judgment of God is something that is real and it is severe. The destruction of the planet and the suffering and death of millions and millions of people is something that we should take and talk about with the utmost level of seriousness. I would say that there may even be times when we speak about such things in hushed tones. Never flippancy. It's not a joke. There's this, there's this sense of sobriety when we talk about these things. God's wrath is not a joke. It's not something light. When we discuss his wrath, we're not talking about something fictional or theoretical. It is real. This is not a video game, y'all. This is not a movie, y'all. We're not dealing with Disney here. We're not talking Pixar here. These are not pixels on screens. These are people. Who will die? Many will die. And so we talk about such things very seriously. It is a sobering reality. Yes, his judgment is absolutely just. We have nothing to be ashamed of. All his actions 
and attributes are praiseworthy, yet his wrath though it is right is not light. And I think a fourth word, and there, be, there may be more words, I'm just giving you four, but I think a fourth word that would describe our response to this revelation is gospel. Gospel. I heard someone say, and I think rightly so, when you think through uh, Matthew 9, uh, 35 through 38, compassion, excuse me, action requires compassion, and compassion requires information. That's helpful. That's a good one-liner. And if you're in Sunday school, you know what I'm talking about, and you know where it came from as well. One of my mentors... I heard him say that, and he was right, in the context of like Matthew 9. Action requires compassion. Compassion requires information. We have information. You have information. We've been sitting here talking about this for what, 30, 40 minutes? You've read it twice. I've explained it to you. You have information. God help us. And he will, as we trust in him. God help that information to lead to compassion and then lead to action in my life this year. I was talking to one of you today, and you said, I, I, don't, I don't have New Year's resolutions, I just have New Year's goals. And, and one of you said, one of my goals is to share the gospel more. Amen! Amen! That's one of my goals, too. I want to share the gospel more. And I think that's a proper response to Revelation chapter 8. Having this information should lead to compassion. Compassion should lead to action. Our knowledge and our compassion should result in gospel-centered praying, warning, and sharing. We must pray and look for opportunities to share the gospel. You have neighbors. Even if you live in the country... And they're a mile and a half down the gravel. You have neighbors. If you work, you have co-workers. If you go to school or you ride a bus, you have other kids that you interact with. You have family members. If you play sports, you have teammates. We all are connected to somebody. And it's very likely that some of those somebodies need to hear the gospel. And we need to be praying in response to something like this, don't you think? I'm sure you agree. I'm sure you agree. You can preach it better than I could. In response to something like this, this ought to lead us to say, I'm going to pray for those somebodies connected to me. I'm going to ask that God would open a door for me to share the gospel with those somebodies. And when, I'm going to ask that God would help me to see the opportunity and take it. Because I cannot, I cannot keep this to myself. Cannot be satisfied. Well, I know Jesus and I'm forgiven and I'm going to heaven and that's good enough. I can't do that. God, help me, please. To not live a life that's just focused on me. To look outward with the eyes of Christ, by the grace of Christ, the Spirit of Christ, to say, That is someone who probably needs to hear the gospel or needs to be challenged to trust in Christ. Oh God, please help me. Please help me. Don't let me be silent. Your wrath is real. Christ has died. Help me talk about it with them. Not in arrogance. Not in callousness. In humility, but compassion. God help us. Glory, gratitude, grief, gospel. Let's pray. Well, God, we thank you for this chapter, this information. And we praise you because you are God. And your judgment is right. It's not light, but it is right. You never, Lord God, you never overstep. You never go too far. Your judgment is right. 
Your wrath is real and it is right. And we should, we should respond and worship you. Acknowledge you are righteous, you are just. And what you have promised you will do. And maybe it's coming sooner than we know. Lord, we would respond to this also with gratitude. And I plead, Lord, you love sinners like me. I, I plead, we plead, those who are your people right now in this moment, we plead, Lord, for those maybe who are in the room who need to trust in Jesus, who need to believe the truth that he died for our sins in our place on the cross, that he took the punishment we deserve, and that he's risen from the dead, that those who need to believe that, trust in Jesus, that they would do that. We pray, Lord, we pray for our neighbors. We pray for teammates, classmates, co-workers, family members, anybody that you may allow us to cross paths with. Oh God, we pray for those somebodies that you've put in our life. Lord, we pray, we pray. Oh God, please give us the compassion. Give us the compassion of Christ. To not stay silent. To, to have the opportunity, to take the opportunity to talk about Jesus with somebody else. Oh, I pray that that goal of I want to share the gospel more this year, that we'd reach that goal, all of us. Please, Lord, help us. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. Jesus Christ, who rescues us from the wrath to come because he suffered your wrath for us on the cross. God, we praise you. We praise you. Oh, I pray, Lord, that as we talk about these things with one another, I pray there be the utmost the utmost hmm, sense of just a, a sobriety, a, a realization that this is real, this is not this is not light. And again, I deserve that. I deserve that. We give you glory. We are grateful. We do grieve. Help us share the gospel. We thank you in Jesus' name.